Good evening. Oh, I'm exhausted. I mean, there's 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 a few books that are that I, I consider to be when you read them, you get kind of weary. Jeremiah is one of those books. You start reading, you go, whew. And it's not it's not the content, it's not the the amount of the book it is, although it is the the, the largest um, non Psalms book. So I, Psalms is obviously the largest book, but anything not Psalms, Jeremiah is the longest book we have in the Old Testament. So it's not it's, it's a long book to, to boot, but it is a it's a weary book. So let's go ahead and uh, open in prayer, and then we'll go ahead and uh, jump into our lesson for this evening. We have a, a good amount to cover, and I, I'm kind of torn about how much I want to read. So I want to be able to read some. So it's a it's fascinating some content. All right, so let's open up. God in heaven, we, we, we thank you that we have your word to be able to read, to understand, to grow from, and help us to be able to put our our minds into the mind of the author and the mind of the recipients of this book so that we understand what you intended and we don't take things out for our own personal use, but we let us sit in history and understand principles and, and gather understanding. We thank you that we have a, um, a book like Jeremiah to be able to, to lament over, to see a prophet who is called and, and works in spite of his circumstances, and above all, he, he kept you on the forefront of his, both of his mind and on his lips to do as you commanded and to, uh, and to give us wonderful prophecies about the coming Messiah and the Messianic reign. We thank you, you are a God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I, I, I do want to make a quick announcement. Next week, no class. Luther and I will be in Houston. Um, if you want to go ahead and uh, get into the read for next week, you can start reading the book of Zephaniah. It'll take you all about four minutes. We'll, well, now, if you want, I, I say that because if I tell you to read that one, you're like, okay, good. And then we're going to, from Zephaniah, about a five-minute little hello, Zephaniah, and goodbye, we're going to go into Ezekiel. So if you want to start reading Ezekiel after that, good luck. <laughs> you start going, oh, wheels, and I, the wheels are going crazy in my head. Um, also, keep in prayer. I uh, see Amy's back there. It's great. And hopefully everything's going well with your arm and other people who are either injured, recovering. Uh, Jean Ann has, uh, has went through knee manipulation on on Tuesday after her knee surgery to kind of stretch out the ligaments and muscles. It, it, and she said it was painful. It was probably it was worse pain than it was after the knee replacement. So, but it's necessary for her to be able to start moving, hopefully. So hopefully that is, it's not just painful, but it is productive. So keep her in prayer. All right. So what have we done so far? There are studies to, to review the prophets, placing them historically within the narrative of the Old Testament. So we're going to talk about where this is in history. And again, I'm still working on a timeline for all the kings and, and nothing seems to really fit what I want to put it in. So I hope I'm successful, but at the same time. We'll see where I get. Our primary goal is to understand what they say about Messiah. So um, remember, we're dealing with the prophets in chronological order. Jonah, Obadiah, Joel, we have a question mark, so we don't know really where they were. We've gone through Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. Uh, and we've gone through Nahum and Habakkuk. We skipped over us. And I realized I made a mistake because I thought that said Zechariah. And I go, I don't want to do Zechariah. That's like 10 chapters. And I wanted to kind of Habakkuk. I could have done Zephaniah instead of Habakkuk. My bad. Um, so I get I do get the Z's confused. So next time we come together, we'll go ahead and go over Zephaniah, which is a contemporary of Jeremiah in the early sections of Jeremiah. And then we'll from uh, Zephaniah, we'll go into Ezekiel and Daniel. And those two books are the books of the exile. What happens during the exile. So it's partly narrative, partly prophecy, dealing with, with the Israelites in Babylon. And then Haggai, Haggai Zechariah, Malachi are books post-exile, dealing with the prophecies after they're coming back to the land and how they are uh, supposed to function and continue post-exile waiting for Messiah. So the five recurring themes, identification of sin, 
Uh, there is warning of judgment, potential of God's forgiveness, encouragement. Uh, now, I'll let you know right now, potential of God's forgiveness. Um, when Jeremiah, not to uh, the nation, to individuals. There's a way to escape death, but not judgment in, the, in Jeremiah. Very interesting in how we kind of like categorize the potential of God's forgiveness in the book of Jeremiah. But primarily messianism. Um, prophecies about the coming Messiah, his kingdom, or what leads into his kingdom. As we have progressed through the prophets, we've seen the messianic predictions have been woven into the prophetic message to David, Israel, Judah, and the nations. The main context from the books of prophecy is judgment and a call to return to the Lord through keeping of the Mosaic covenant. Isaiah contains the most information about the identity and function of the coming Messiah and some of the most descriptive characteristics of how Messiah will first come as a suffering servant and will sacrifice himself for the redemption of all. Moving forward from Isaiah, and by the way, Jeremiah is about 60 years later. So, you know, um, the, the moving forward from Isaiah, prophecies against Judah begin ramping up as the sin of Manasseh found in 2 Kings chapter 21, when he reigned between 695 and 642. Some people think that Jeremiah was actually alive during the time of Manasseh, though at a very young age. And after Manasseh, only King Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But the rest, nearly 100 years of tremendous wickedness, injustice, idolatry, and murder. From Manasseh all the way through, the last king of Israel, which is not really a king of Israel. He's kind of just a, the uncle of a king and kind of just a placeholder. Habakkuk pleads against Judah. Um, and when kind of, we're kind of using Habakkuk as kind of the backdrop of Jeremiah as well. But when God tells Habakkuk that he will bring the Chaldeans, Habakkuk complains about the bringing an evil people to judge the evil actions of Judah. And Jeremiah kind of picks up the same idea. Here's kind of a timeline of, of, of Jeremiah. You see that Jehoiakim becomes king of Judah around 609. Again, dates are approximate. We, they didn't have a Gregorian calendar. They didn't tell us the actual date. Jeremiah delivers... Uh, his temple sermon, and I like how they say that because he basically stands up and he just goes, hey, king. And he just starts yelling at people. And it's very, uh, everybody's going, what just happened here? Because uh, they weren't expecting anything like this to come from, and especially he's a very young man. We'll go ahead and explain that in a moment. Zedekiah becomes king in seven, um, 97, um, and... Jeremiah urges Zedekiah to submit to Babylon. This is what really gets him in trouble. Because when he starts telling them, hey, Babylon's going to take over, and instead of fighting, instead of even a repenting and going back to the Lord, and using the word repenting, English word, not necessarily the, 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 uh, the Hebrew or a Greek term, but to return to the Lord, um, that's not going to help you here. You could make all the sacrifices. You can do all the hard things. It's too late. If you want to survive... Go out of the city and submit to Babylon. If you stay in the city, you're going to die. So in 586, Jerusalem falls and the exiles are taken to Babylon. And Jeremiah, soon after that, is taken to Egypt where he dies later in Egypt. So I have his prophetic ministry, not his life, but his prophetic ministry going from 627 to 586 B.C. Basically from the time of, uh, of late Josiah to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that's where basically he's quiet. There are, there are some, some uh, lamentations probably written in, in response to it, but it's right after. Jeremiah prophes prophesies during the darkest days of Judah. And I say the darkest days of Judah because Israel has already been taken captive. In fact, there are prophecies to Israel within the book of Jeremiah saying, Hey, Israel, you're much better than these people. You're much better than Judah. Come back. Come back. Just return to me and, and we, you can come back to your land. They don't. Okay. But God's like, Israel, you didn't hold a candle to the wickedness that Judah had at the end. Jeremiah was the only prophet, and there were many false prophets during his day, to tell Judah and the kings the truth about the exile into Babylon. All the other prophets in the book of Jeremiah, which are not true prophets, 
all lie and say, ah, Babylon won't succeed. They'll turn back. And even after it's imminent, there's even a nice story here about a guy goes, two years will be back. Two years. I'll give two years. God will bring you back. And even Jeremiah goes, oh, if that were true. Oh, let, let, let that be true. Two years would be fantastic. Here's some interesting points about Jeremiah the man. He's born the son of a priest. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. So he is a priest. As a priest, as a son of a priest, what are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be a priest. You're, you're basically in priest, uh, a priest in training. When do you become um, a priest? When, do you, uh, when are you allowed to begin your ministry in the Jewish culture? How old do you have to be? Anybody know? 30. Maybe 30 years old. If you're not 30, you're too young. You're just a boy. So when Jeremiah says, I'm a youth, he might be 22. Now, we, we, he's 20. The information we have, he's 21 years old when he begins his ministry, which is nine years before he's born. He's, that is considered to be very young. Um, he is chosen to be a prophet before he was born in 1-5. Before I formed you in the, in, your, in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations before he was even conceived. God had Jeremiah in mind. In verse 9, uh, well, sorry, verse 6, he was called to be a prophet at a young age. Again, alas, O Lord, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. That doesn't mean he's five, okay? Has anybody ever watched the 1998 movie with Patrick Dempsey? Really? No one? It's actually done very well. It's one of the better ones about the Bible. They're pretty consistent throughout the entire story. And Patrick Dempsey just plays an excellent Jeremiah. That's sarcasm. It's Patrick Dempsey. You know, he's, he's, he's not known for his acting ability. Although it, it is well done, though, and I think it, it stays pretty consistent to the text. But in the, in the movie itself, yes, I watched the movie in research. I'm kind of curious. I go, oh, yeah, there's a movie about this, and it's free. I got to look at this. Um, I, I do think I remember watching it a long time ago, but it had been a while. Um, but they have Jeremiah being called when he was like five. And he's hearing these dreams and he's, you know, he's dreaming these things. And his father comes up, what are you dreaming? And he tells him and he's like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And then later on, he gets the call. In verse nine, I called this an encounter with a Christophany. Because remember, God is not a man. He's a spirit. All right. And any time that you have a personification of God, the Lord, coming down, talking, reaching out and, and speaking with people or touching people, it's going to be Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. In verse nine, then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and overflow overthrow to build and to plant so who's touching him who's talking with him jeremiah is encountering jesus christ pre-incarnate um in second chronicles 35 25 you don't have to turn there uh, when josiah dies kind of tragically and everyone's kind of like everyone loves josiah jeremiah is there and writes a dirge for him forbidden to marry and have children as a visual testimony over Judah. We'll talk about that later. But God told him, don't get married and don't have kids. And you'll find out why. A lot of people take this practically. Oh, he wants to have Jeremiah completely consecrated to the Lord. No, it's a testimony. It's kind of like Hosea when he was told to marry a prostitute and have kids of, of, of harlotry. It wasn't because God says, hey, be kind to this harlot. It's because it's a testimony against Israel about how he's getting married and how he's having kids. He's known as the prophet with no success. Now, there is a few people within the book of Jeremiah that are his friends, like three. And there are a few people that think that Jeremiah's words are important and want to take it to the king, although the king rejects them. So it's not that they say he has zero converts. I go, ah, and I hate the word convert, you know. Um, but they basically say he has nobody. It's not true. 
fact, he has a very important individual that's in his life that is his friend, and his friend makes sacrifices, and God's going to bless him as well. He's known as a prophet with no success. He was rejected by his people, hated, beaten, put in stocks, imprisoned for treason, and left for dead in a cistern where all it was was mud. And he had to have a, a eunuch beg for his life to the king to get out of that cistern. His desire was to be wrong, even permitting false prophecy for a time. Again, this is the uh, another prophet who prophesies in which he's like, he, he's like, he knows it's not right, yet he kind of like just kind of lets it go. And then God tells him, no, go back and tell the guy. He actually tried to quit. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20. Verse 7. Remember when you're lamenting to God, it's okay to be over the top as long as you come to your senses. A lot of people think is it, it's wrong to question God. It's not wrong to question God as long as you seek the answers. It's not wrong to lament to God as long as you come to understand the truth. To leave the lament where it is means you're not relying upon his promises and his truth to overcome your circumstances. And so when you read a lament like this, don't think that, that Jeremiah's gone crazy. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud, I proclaim violence and destruction, because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. In other words, if I try to stop, God won't let me. Okay, There are certain people within the scriptures that God says, this is your job, and you will do it. Can you think of another person? Jonah? Even Paul said, if I do this because I have to, I'm doing it under compulsion. God's prodding me. Go and talk to the nations. That's his job. A lot of people tried to take Jeremiah as an example of standing up tall in a world and go, I want to be like Jeremiah. Really? Read it. That's like asking to be beaten. He was permitted to remain in the land by the captain of Babylonian forces. When the remnant, or basically the people who were left, who did not go to Babylon... Uh, were to flee to Egypt because Babylon was going to wipe out every single person in the land of Israel that did not go to Israel. Jeremiah was going to stay and say, been, been fine. But he was actually forced to go with the Israelites, the Jews that survived, to Egypt in chapter 43. And tradition says that he was stoned by his own people in Egypt. How much success did Jeremiah have? Not much. His book becomes one of the most important books of both history and prophecy that we have today. Sometimes, like Isaiah also, even though Isaiah had very little successes and that people did not turn, he did have some people respect him. And he basically survived until Manasseh. The, his, the, the tradition says that Manasseh is the one who killed him. So he had a lot of influence. Jeremiah... Every single king that he encountered um, basically said, I should kill you. When he says Babylon's going to take over the city, they're going, treason. You're working with them. Again, foundations of the book. Uh, wait, one more time. There you go. There you go. Foundations of the book. Very long. Psalms, 145 pages. Jeremiah, 109. Isaiah, 106. First and second kings together is 100. First and second chronicles together is 99. So, again, the, the amount of information that's contained in the book of Jeremiah, not only as history, but also as prophecy, is very daunting in just the amount of information you have. You could break the book up into sections and actually kind of, you know, take it in pieces as a per day thing. Um, but he, uh, trying to read it in one sitting. And again, it's very repetitive. 
It's a lot of death and destruction, blood and guts, and some some perverse language. Don't don't just read this to your kids. This isn't a bedtime story. Okay. Some of the book seems to be scribed by Baruch, but other places state that Jeremiah was told to write. Now, don't take this as a contradiction. Take this as understanding that sometimes Jeremiah wrote it himself, and sometimes he spoke it, and Baruch wrote it down. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 30. Thus says the Lord, uh, basically we'll start in verse 1. The word came to, to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book or a scroll. In chapter 36, verse 2. That's another thing. Not only is it a lot of chapters, it's, it's a lot of words per chapter. Verse 2 says, Take a scroll to Jeremiah and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. So basically encapsulate everything. In verse 15, okay, Baruch is reading the scroll of which Jer of what we're just referring to. In verse 15, they said, sit down, please read it to us. So Baruch read it to them. When they heard all of the words, they turned in fear one to another and said to Baruch, we will surely report all these words to the king. And they asked Baruch saying, tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Then Baruch said to him, he dictated all these words to me and I wrote them with ink on the book. So, when Jeremiah is responsible for the content, sometimes he's not the one necessarily penning it. Okay? It's not a problem, and you understand the exact context of writing and or not writing. Finally, in Jeremiah 51, verse 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a single scroll all the calamity which would come upon Babylon. That is, all these words that have been written concerning Babylon. So that's specific concerning Babylon there. Um, so as we're as we kind of if you're looking at the content here, we're, we're making sure that we understand that sometimes it's not Jeremiah necessarily writing it, but all the content is of Jeremiah. Jeremiah has the least coveted job in the Old Testament. A lot of people look at Job's life and go, I wouldn't want to go through that. But Job at the end was heavily blessed, you know, double what he had before. And, and he went through a lot and, and personal agony and loss and pain, even having a couple of really bad advisors, even from his wife in his ear. Um, Jeremiah, though, the other prophets seem to have respect and sometimes fear. You know, sometimes people like, okay, I don't necessarily like what you're saying, but at least they feared and they respected that prophet. Job lives a life of affliction, but it was restored. Jeremiah was supposed to live a life of importance as a priest and respect, but as a prophet, he was the most hated and most tortured person of the Hebrew scriptures, never seem, never living, never having, in, in this life, never having joy humanly speaking jeremiah 9 1 i have it up here oh that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that i may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people a lot of people like to use jeremiah and use the content of jeremiah to rail against the evils of nations but not one has this type of angst about him. He's prophesying against the people who he loves. He doesn't hate the king. He wants the king to understand. He doesn't hate the people of Judah. He wants them to survive, and there is a way to survive. Don't stay in Jerusalem. Go out and, and surrender. 
That's the only way you're going to survive this. And because his prophecies become true, they hate Jeremiah all the more. When it comes down to a man of sorrows, if people like to take certain prophets as, as a picture of Christ, and I don't do that, I don't think it's necessarily biblical. However, if there was a prophet that emulated the, the, the sorrow of Jesus Christ, it's Jeremiah. The, 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 um, Peter talks about that he was a witness of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Peter wasn't at the cross. Peter didn't witness the cross. Peter witnessed Jesus Christ going from town to town, area to era, area, being hated, despised, threatened, and nearly destroyed several times, if not for the will of God. Even in a, he, Jesus Christ, even in his, in his own hometown, when he prophesied and told them, they wanted to push him off a cliff. And he miraculously, I still think it's a miracle, got lost in, in the crowd. Jeremiah is in the same boat. Here's some key phrases in the book of Jeremiah. Says the Lord and declares the Lord 322 times. Who's the author of this book? Oh, humanly speaking, we know it's Jeremiah. Who's the author? It doesn't say, thus says Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, thus declares the Lord, 322 times. Lord of hosts, 71 times. Why Lord of hosts? Why not Jehovah Yasha, the God who saves? Why not the God who provides? Why the Lord of hosts? What does it mean? What does the Lord of hosts mean? He is the Lord of armies, and he is coming to do war. Judgment is coming. He's using Babylon to do it. But he calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant and basically judging you. Habakkuk hates this. He doesn't understand it. But God is using the armies of the nations to come against Israel. Judah to be specific. The word of the Lord 53 times. King of Judah. He uh, directly addresses the king of Judah 52 times. That's not supposed to be God of Israel. That's not right. Um, it's actually the uh, the house of Israel. I don't know. That's I probably like I'm going back to Isaiah, right? So house of Israel forty nine times. So he's addressing Judah and Israel. Now we get some more obscure ones, but very important ones. Days are coming fifteen times. Days are coming, says the Lord. When? And he's going to talk about future. Sometimes it's judgment, but a lot of these days are coming. It's about the restoration of Israel. I'm sorry they only got to chapter 20. You really should have started at chapter 30. That's good stuff. Great reprieve. By the sword 15 times. If you don't go out, you will die by the sword. You're going to get killed in a vicious, warlike manner. And here's one that's important, and I'm going to ask you why it's important. Seventy years is used three times in the book of Jeremiah. Why is that important? That's the length of the captivity in Babylon spoken by the word of Jeremiah. Who reads that prophecy 70 years later and tells people, get ready, it's time to go? Anybody remember? Daniel. Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah. Saying, 70 years have I decreed. Hey, it's about 70. Let's get ready to go. And gets the people prepared to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Now, Jeremiah is a uh, an actor. In fact, most of the book of Jeremiah is actually poetry. Very similar to Psalms, prophetic Psalms. In fact, if you, if you kind of scroll through a lot like Isaiah, a lot of poetry contained in the book of Jeremiah. Yes, it's, 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 uh, it's prophetic, but it's told in a poetic uh, understanding. Also part of Jeremiah's life 
is his life is actually poetic. Turn over to Jeremiah 13. How many? <laughs> There's some things you I don't know if you like block out or you don't really understand when you read it. Like, a, you know, it's been a couple of years since you read a book. You kind of go, I don't remember this. Jeremiah 13 was one of the things I did not remember. Thus says the Lord, go and buy yourself a linen waistband. What is that? It's underwear. Okay. Um, and put it around your waist, and but do not put it in water. So I bought the waistband according to the word of the Lord, and I put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord said to me a second time, saying, take the waistband that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise, and go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in the crevice of the rock. So basically, buy some underwear, don't wash it. Then take it, wear it around, then take it and go bury it near the Euphrates. Okay. And I did as the Lord commanded me. After many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go back to the Euphrates and take from there the waistband which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug and took the waistband in the place where I had hidden it. And lo, the waistband was ruined. It was totally worthless. Okay. <laughs> Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Could you just said that? Do I need to go wear it, buy some underwear, wear it, go bury it, go dig it up later, find it ruby ruined to have this explained to me? <laughs> Strange things, right? Jeremiah 16. This is where Jeremiah is not to take a wife. The word of the Lord also came to me saying, You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons or daughters in this place. For the Lord, for thus says the Lord concerning sons and daughters born in this place. Okay, so don't do it. And here's why. You're a life example. As a prophet, as somebody in ministry in Israel, it's common, it's common for people to still get married. It's not like they're a prophet or a priest and they don't get married. They're not Catholic. All right. They're supposed to get married. They're, they're supposed to fulfill the be fruitful and multiply concept. But don't do it. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters born in this place and concerning their mothers who bear them and their fathers who beget them in this land. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. They will be as dung on the surface of the ground and come to end by sword or famine. And their carcasses will, will become food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth. Oof. Don't have kids. Don't have a wife. Why? And so when people go, hey, why aren't you married? Here's why. How's that as a behavioral witness? Jeremiah 18. Anybody love the song? I am the clay. You are the potter. All right? Again, God has, 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 uses Jeremiah to put things into visual picture to kind of demonstrate something. Now, you probably really don't know what that means. How do I know that? Because rereading this, you're going, oh, this isn't a little unusual. The word, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. In other words, he's making it, and the, pot, and the clay is being difficult. So he goes, ah, start over. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as the potter does? declares the Lord, behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God is working with the pot, with the clay, forming it, using it for the, as an analogy of the house of Israel. And Israel, all of Israel, is being difficult. So he goes, fine. Let me start over. And that's basically his, he's the, he's the potter. Israel's the clay. And he can go ahead and smash it and start over again. He's not talking about a man. He's talking about the nation of Israel. 
And even when you go into vessels of honor and dishonor in, in Romans chapter 9, it's not talking about people. He's talking about vessels, nations for honor and dishonor. Very interesting. Jeremiah 25. 15 to 32. So it, we think it's a vision, the way that it's kind of written and the way it kind of like shapes up. We think it's a vision. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. So the, 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 the cup of wrath, the wine of wrath that they're going to be made to drink, basically is going to bring judgment upon them. And then he took the cup and goes around, and, and, and I love this, Jerusalem in, in verse 18, and the cities of Judah and its kings and its princes to make them a ruin, a horror, a hissing, and a curse as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all the foreign people, and he starts naming them all. In verse 27, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink, be drunk, vomit, fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. Basically, just as people who get drunk, get drunk and just pass out. So uh, the wrath that's going to come upon you is going to make you fall and you're not getting back up again. In verse 28, and if it will be, if they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink. <coughs> then you will say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you shall surely drink this. For behold, I am beginning to work calamity in this city, which is called by my name, and shall be completely free from punishment. You will not be free from punishment, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. So basically, even if they refuse to drink it, Jeremiah, make them drink it. And basically what it's saying here is this. Jeremiah, take these bad words of judgment, of fear and frustration that they're going to hear, and do not let them not hear you. And they will hear you, and they will suffer the consequences of their wickedness, injustice, and idolatry. In Jeremiah 27 through 28, God tells them, Jeremiah, make for yourself a bond, basically a yoke. Uh, sometimes it's depicted as, a, as almost like a cross. I think it's basically like something. He, he walks around with this thing for, for a while. Um, some people think up to a couple months, it's broken off by a false prophet and, and Hananiah's false prophecy in chapter 28. But basically he walks around with this yoke on his, on his neck, walking around Jerusalem, basically going, this is what's going to happen to you. Okay. I'm like, so it, he, he just puts on this, he, he just kind of imagine, and you can imagine all these different things that are happening to Jeremiah. What do you think about Jeremiah? The guy's a little loony, okay? And all the prophets kind of act like this sometimes, you know? They always do kind of weird things. You know, I think of it, Elijah and Elisha, especially when they start getting these visual signs. It's done to cause people to not forget you. Even if you don't like it, you're going to remember it. And Jeremiah walks around with these yokes on his neck to demonstrate to them, you're going to go into bondage. Finally, in Jeremiah 32, 6 through 15, very interesting here, okay? This is during, in the middle of the good news. So in Jeremiah 32, in verse 6, Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanimal, the son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you saying, buy for yourself my field. Why? Everyone in Israel is selling land because the Babylonians are coming to take them away. So why am I going to have land? I might as well go ahead and have some money in my pockets so when I go to Babylon, I can go ahead and buy some hummus. So not everyone's in agreement. Some people see the writing on the wall, and so some people are buying and some people are selling. Jeremiah, who's prophesying, everyone here is either going to die or going to exile. Here's what he does. Buy for yourself the field. That's what God tells him. Then Hanamel, my uncle, in verse 8, came to the court of the guard 
according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at the end of, of Enoth, which is the land of Benjamin. For you had the right of possession and of redemption. It is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field, which was at An 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 Anathoth, from Hanamel, my uncle's son. And I weighed out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. Not inexpensive. I signed and see sealed the deed and called in witnesses and weighed out the silver on scales. A very formal, very precise deed transfer for land that would not be used. Then I took the deeds of purchase and sealed the copy to con and containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Nerai. That's basically the one who transcribes a lot. And I commanded Baruch in verse 13 in the presence of saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, this sealed deed of purchase, and this open deed, and put them in earthenware jar, that they may last a long time. For thus says the Lord God of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. To sign, saying, even though we're all leaving, even though we're either going to die or be exiled, and no, notice that Jeremiah didn't say, I'm going to come back. Notice Jeremiah didn't say, I'm going to regain this possession. Jeremiah is basically saying, in this land, it will be bought and sold again. Israel will return. An outline of the book. Um, I have seven major points. Obviously, we can break it down way into basic ones. But the call of Jeremiah during the reign of Josiah, chapter 1. Then you have seven messages against Judah uh, during Jehoiakim in chapters 22 through 20. Then you have uh, seven messages against Judah during Zedekiah in chapters 21 through 29. Then prophecies about the restoration of Judah and Israel is in chapter 30 through 33. It has this little short narrative in chapter 32. Again, some dangers and some purchases and kind of some crazy stuff happening in chapter 32. But um, 30 through 33 are prophecies about the restoration of Judah and Israel. Specifically, messianic reign type prophecies. Not just returning from exile, but glorious return. Uh, fifth section, uh, chapter 34 through 45, the narrative section about the fall of Judah. So what leads up to it, the actual falling of it, and the kind of the immediate aftermath from 34 through 50, th from 34 to 45. And then in chapter 46 through 51, he prophesies against the nations, similar to what happens in the book of Isaiah. In chapter 52, it, it, it uh, has the fall of Jerusalem. And the fall of Jerusalem mirrors the end of 2 Kings and 2 Kings. And a lot of the same language. It kind of breaks it up. In fact, they, it is believed, not we don't know for 100% certain, that this might have been, have been written by Baruch rather than by Jeremiah. Or possibly when everything's being gathered together, this may have been put at the end as a verification for people reading the book of Jeremiah only of what happened in a kind of a, uh, of a historical account proving what Jeremiah's prophecies were saying come to true, basically validating his prophecies. So a lot of people don't think 52 is actually part of the book of Jeremiah, but I have no problem with it either being added on later or being written by Baruch or actually being written by Jeremiah himself as he's kind of uh, – leaving the area. So why do we do the books of Jeremiah? Why do we go, why are we going through the prophecies? What's the main point of emphasis? Messianism. Understanding both prophecies about the Messiah specifically and about the reign of Messiah, what leads up to Messiah, about the, the kingdom itself, other kind of various understandings. And there's a lot. Uh, we'll read some of it, but a lot of it I'll go ahead and just put up on the screen for you so you can go ahead and write them down and look at them later. We'll go ahead and look at this first one, though, Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. In the middle of kind of a condemnation in 23, 1 through 4, talking about the shepherds of Israel. 
Not talking about the ones who are actually shepherding sheep. Okay. We're talking about the leadership. Behold, in verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in, his, in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And, and, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Okay. So right here in Jeremiah 23, 5, 6, we have a branch prophecy. We have a branch prophecy in the book of Isaiah. We have two branch prophecies in the book of Jeremiah. And we have two more branch prophecies in the, books, in the book of Zechariah. And all of them are very specific, dealing with the Messiah, this branch concept. Daniel has another reference. He's a different word, but it's very similar. So we'll, when we get to Dan Daniel, we'll talk about that. So in this uh, prophecy here, this is about the Messianic prophecy as the reigning righteous king. A lot of people who don't understand prophecy look at da Jeremiah 23, and then they start saying, a righteous branch and reign as king and act wisely, and they go, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. Did he fulfill this prophecy? Not yet. He's not, it's not a spiritual kingdom. It's not ruling in your hearts with justice. He's not dealing with people and, and you know, kind of and and uh dishing out justice under undercover. This is dealing with the messianic kingdom. When he comes down, he will rule and reign with righteousness, with justice in the land. In the land. I remember when Luther was talking about on this planet, <laughs> in the land. You can't sit there and make this spiritual or mystical. You have to put it into the place of what Israel understood and what they were going to look forward to. In the land. This is in the middle of calamity, this prophecy. And, I, and it, it's... it's fascinating how Jeremiah and the Lord in the middle of judgment and blood and guts and gore hope now if you're going to read Jeremiah and look for the messianic hope and look for the messianic promises it really is contained within chapters 30 through 33 we'll read a few of these the ones that are a little longer I'll go ahead and just put up as a, as a reference here on the screen in Jeremiah 30, verses 8 through 11, it shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their necks and will tear their bonds. And strangers will no longer make them their slaves, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So this is not only a promise of return from exile, but also a Davidic king will reign. This is right after you know, in verses 5 through 6, going, hey, can men give birth? That's kind of a strange question concerning today's uh, events, right? You know, like people are going, oh, hey, men can give birth because if a woman declares to be himself a man, they get pregnant. That, to, to, the, to the community now, a man's given birth. Okay. No, a man cannot give birth. Then why do I see men holding their bellies as if they're in labor? The pain and the anguish, it's an example of just the, of, of all the different calamities that are going to come upon the people. But in verse 8, I'll break the yokes. You'll come back and you'll serve the Davidic king. In Jeremiah 30, verses 8 through 11, the promise of return from exile for Judah and the Davidic kingdom will reign. In, verse, in chapter 30, verse 17, for I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of the wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying, It's a Zion, no one cares for her, but God will show them love. Chapter 30, verses 18 through 22, another restoration of Israel. Chapter 31 through 1 through 22, another continues on with this restoration of Israel. A lot of imagery and poetry and, and, and things for them to remember in their mind's eye as they as they look forward to this return from exile, people are reading the book of Jeremiah and it's written to the people who are about ready to go into exile. And if they're in exile, this is what they're holding, hold, holding on to. This is the hope 
Now, that's going to be 70 years. In the book of Haggai, when they're rebuilding the temple, they'll go look at this. How many of you were here when this was, when, who, how many people here saw the original temple? And there was a population of people who actually survived the entire exile period. They go, don't worry about it. Even though it doesn't look that great, it's going to be great. In Jeremiah 31, 27 through 30, look at that. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. As I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant. So God is using both the example of the potter and the clay and agricultural understanding to help you understand, sometimes I burn the field and I will restore it. Sometimes I break the pot and I remake it. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, in the previous law system, when a father sins, who pays the penalty? The children. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. A new form of justice under the kingdom. The coming kingdom. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. This is probably the most well-known section of Jeremiah because everyone loves this and says, this, this is us. We found the church. Jeremiah. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when we will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband of them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law upon their heart. I will put my law up within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Who is the covenant with? This is very simple. Because it says forgiveness, and I will, I will not, I will, and their sin I will remember no more. Because of that, you think this is for us? Remember a very important lesson when you're dealing with Bible study. Just because something sounds similar doesn't mean that it's equated to it. Just because under the under the new covenant, this language is used doesn't mean that the new covenant applies to us, the church. We are not the house of Israel. We are not the house of Judah. And furthermore, um, when, is the, when is his law written upon us? When does it happen that each man will not teach his neighbor? What are we doing now? Obviously, none of you are saved because you have to have a teacher. And obviously, I'm not saved because I have to have a teacher too. If the new covenant was enacted now, we would have no need for any knowledge because we would all know it. We would all know the Lord. Israel during the millennial kingdom will have no need for a teacher. They will all know the Lord. I don't know how that's accomplished. I don't know what's going on specifically, but it's the house of Israel and house of Judah. The nations during the millennial reign at the end will rebel. What do you do with that? Even during the millennial reign, there will be sin and rebellion. Sorry. I know I shocked you. What? Chapter 31, verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light and day and the fixed order of moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me before the Lord, declare, before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. 
Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offsprings of Israel for, for all they have done, declares the Lord. In other words, because of their sin, I will go ahead and dismiss them as a nation. I will go ahead and drop my covenant if you can measure the, uh, the universe. If the order of the sun, moon, and stars is no longer fixed. In other words, he's using a descriptive understanding to say it will never, ever, 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 ever happen. Israel will be God's nation forever. Now, what's forever mean? What's forever mean? Forever means to the end of the age. What age? The end of the physical age. This is, when we go to age of ages, I don't know if Israel will remain a nation. There's a lot of different thoughts about that. I'm going to let Luther handle that when he gets to Revelation chapter 20, 21. Because I'm like still working on a little bit. But I do know this, that when the word forever is used, you're looking at ages. Okay? Chapter 31, 38 through 40, promise to, of Jerusalem to re be rebuilt and never to be destroyed again. They went back. 70 years later, okay, 516 B.C., 515 B.C., and what happened in 70 A.D.? Destroyed and destroyed. So what when that prophecy dealing with? Hmm. What Jerusalem? Interesting. In Jeremiah 33, verses 1 through 9, though the destruction from the Chaldeans is imminent, Judah will be pardoned and restored. A lot of repetitive restoration concepts. In Jeremiah 33, 10 through 11, we'll read that one. Thus says the Lord, yet again there will be heard in this place of which you say, it is waste without man, without beast. That is, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, there are desolate without man, without inhabitant, without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Of those who bring a thank offering to the house of the Lord, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were the first, says the Lord. In fact, in Jeremiah 33, 12 through 13, the number of man and beast will be innumerable. Remember back in Jeremiah 31, he says, I'm going to sow the land with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And at the end in Jeremiah 33, he says, there's a lot of people and a lot of animals. At one point, barren wasteland. But when I come, when, when it's at the end, innumerable. You can't count how many people and beasts will be in the land of Israel. Finally, in Jeremiah 33, 14 through 24, once again, it's a branch prophecy. Verse 14, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at the time of at the time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. It's basically a repeat of that branch prophecy from Jeremiah 23. Now. Are those all the Messianic prophecies in the book of Jeremiah? There's one of which I am still working with. And it's going to, it actually affects Matthew. And that is the curse of Jehoiakim. Um, the curse of Jehoiakim basically says, tell Jehoiakim, not one of your descendants will ever sit on the throne. His, his sons were murdered, although it appears as though he has some later on. And go turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Verse 10. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Manasseh, obviously bad king, Amon, bad king, Amon, the father of Josiah, Josiah, good king. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers. Who are the brothers of Jeconiah? Jehoiakim. Um, and, he's, and, uh, and he's basically Jeconiah. It, there's names that are kind of weird about this. It is believed that Jeconiah, there's a curse against Jeconiah, that his seed, his line, 
will not be on the throne of David. And so when you get down to verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. And so I'll give you a preview. This is believed to be the line of Joseph, and Joseph is not truly the father of Jesus. So why go through the line? You ever think about that? Why go through the line? In Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38, there's another line. Jesus, about 30 years of age, being supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Go down. This is another line of the son of David, but not through Solomon, but through Nathan. I have a question for you. If, if Matthew is to, to, to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the line of kings, and Luke presents the genealogy of Jesus Christ to the Son of God in verse 38, Son of Adam, the Son of God. Why aren't they reversed? And so here's what I'm working with. Here's the question I'm, going to have, I, I'm proposing. Truly, which one? Is Matthew the, the line of Joseph and, and Luke the line of Mary or vice versa? There's, I have a question about that. Number two... Does the line of Jehoiakim, or the, the curse of, Jehoi, uh, of Je Jeconiah, um, become problematic in demonstrating that Jesus is, uh, is the king? Does the actual curse to Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, is it perpetual all the way down to Jesus Christ? That's a question I have. And that's why I didn't really go over in Jeremiah, because I'm working with it. And I have a few more questions. And be, when I get to Matthew, I promise to give you options, not necessarily conclusions. All right. So keep that in mind. And, and that's where we get from Jeremiah. And we, again, we'll be talking from Jeremiah. We'll go forward to what's next? Uh, Zephaniah and Ezekiel. I hope to have both Zephaniah, a little blurb, and then Ezekiel. And we'll, again, we'll try to keep these in order. From there, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I'm looking at about six more weeks. And then Matthew. Don't get too excited. All right. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and conclude for the evening. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we are here and able to listen and grow and understand your word better. Help us to take in the book of Jeremiah and emphasize in understanding it, understanding both the judgment and the blessings, the curse and the grace given to Israel because of your choice and because of your promises, you create a new covenant for them because they did not keep the old one. Help us to be able to uh, understand it in the context, to understand the, the historical nature of it, not claim things that are not for ourselves, but allow it to be where it is and take principles from the book of Jeremiah so that we can also understand his character and understand that we can live in any circumstance by your grace. We pray for those who are injured, who are hurting, uh, recovering. Give them both strength and understanding. Help them to have eternal purposes and give the doctors wisdom and their bodies to be, the ability to heal. We thank you that you are our God. And uh, your eternity lasts a lot longer than this earth. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.